preferred developer than Nicholas Group is in fact no more than a group of five prisoners who put together a business with ten with one thousand pounds working capital. And they are you aware also that the lead member of that group has already been involved in about seven, 16 and 17 companies, most of which are now closed down. And are you aware that when they did the same exercise that plan to do here for us in Wales, in mid Wales, um, they did build the houses and plan, and then they went close and went out of business. And we were left, they were left with a row of hundred houses, but no golf resort. And I will buy wood that could happen here if we use that because of that that prepared Thank you. Thank you. I do 
think it's concerning, to say the least, that there has been a, um, an overall reduction um, in the number of apprenticeship places from uh, 43,600 new apprenticeships between May and July. And that's down from 113,000 uh, for the same period in 2016. Um, I'm a big supporter of the apprenticeship levy. I, I do think it's the right thing to do. We do need to get um, more apprentices uh, in, uh, in employment. We, we particularly uh, know the awards of this in, in this part of the world. Um, and as we know from April, the, um, the apprenticeship levy has been in place so that any organisations with a wage of more than three million pounds pay a more than five percent levy to cover the cost of apprenticeships. Um, however, my big concern about this policy is whilst I agree there should be a levy, the way it's being operated by the government I think is very, very um, uh, uh, regressive in the sense that particularly we can't use the apprenticeship levy for salaries to take on apprentices and therefore we have to focus almost the entire sum of money on existing staff. Now that's great for existing staff, we can upskill them. But my um, my hope was that the apprenticeship levy would enable us here in work to take on um, hundreds of new, particularly young school leaders um, on the books of the council and give them a, a career, uh, give them a, a hope for um, progression through the council. But we can't use any of the apprenticeship levy for salaries. So the, so the only money that we've been able to use to take on the apprenticeships is the 150,000 which this administration put in the budget to growth item for this year. And that will uh, lead to about roughly about 20 apprentices being taken on. Now that's great, but I do think because of the inflexible way in which the government are operating the rules around the apprenticeships, we're missing a massive opportunity to really make a huge difference to the lives of our young people by enabling them to, to be taken on by not just the council but other organisations in the public and private sector. So, uh, Madam Mayor, I, I do intend to take this up with the relevant minister and, and ask um, the government to rethink the, the way in which this uh, levy is operated because we need to give our young people some hope. I'm afraid this will not lead to the revolution in apprenticeships that we will promise. Uh, the next um, response is to a question from Councillor Elton, uh, Peel, Rural Waters, and you asked, by, you asked about two projects. Um, first of all, there is, uh, David, I think, an intention, well, I know there is an intention for Peel to um, develop some residential units. Um, they're working on, with us, and uh, under us, a project now around the North Bank which is the area next to the um, what used to be the old grain uh, warehouses which have been uh, converted into apartments. So either side of that, um, I'm hopeful that there will be an announcement in the next couple of months that will detail to that. So that will be great news um, for, uh, for, for everybody really because it will mean uh, the first residential units will appear um, but, but appear the fills on, on the waters with our, with our help and support. My understanding on the International Trade Centre that that's been put on the back burner by Peel, uh, precisely what their intentions are, you need to ask them. Uh, but there are other priorities as well as the residential units. So I would, um, I would uh, uh, um, particularly cite um, a project called the Maritime Knowledge Hub, which is the, um, on the site of the old Venetian Tower, where they plan to convert that into a, um, a centre, a business centre, for maritime companies, and John Rawls University are going to provide um, academic expertise um, as part of that. That's very close to uh, agreements. There's a bid for the single investment fund from the local city region, which uh, looks very positive at the moment. Um, with something called the Engineering Skills Factory, which is the old the mobile building at the other end of rural waters. Um, which again is uh, subject to the uh, SIF bid. That's around providing incubator space in a very large, kind of effectively, warehouse for engineering companies 
uh, to start up with very reasonable terms, easy in and easy out. And again, that looks as though it's uh, quite close to fr fruition. And then, then the other project which Peel are, are working on is a, uh, a centre for people with dementia, uh, which is going to go uh, planning on uh, putting in the area around where the residential uh, apartments are. So those are the main projects which Peel uh, have got in the pipe pipeline, and I uh, am hopeful that we've been waiting long enough um, that, that all these projects will come to fruition in the next um, 12 to 18 months. Um, Councillor, Councillor Ellis um, asked about the, um, the Holy Lake uh, um, Gulf um, uh, uh, Resort and the, um, the Nicholas Group. Just um, to give Council an update on, on this project, uh, the Council uh, has received the funding and the phasing plan um, from, the, uh, from, the, from the developers um, and that came in last week. Um, commercial and confidence document from, from the Nicholas Joint Venture Group and this is now being assessed by our officers um, and our consultants. Once this work is completed and I think uh, the, the information I've been given it will take around eight weeks then if it's acceptable it will all be brought forward to Cabinet for a decision. And in terms of the, the points that uh, Jerry made about the, um, the, the Nicholas Group of course, as part of that funding and um, uh, phasing plan, um, of course there will be due diligence done, as you would expect for any large commercial venture, and again that will be reported back at the appropriate time to Cabinet. Um, and then I think finally, Councillor Gilchrist, uh, the Rural Growth Company. Uh, the Rural Growth Company, I mean I've talked about the Rural Growth Company many times before, uh, members will mainly aware that we are at the procurement phase at the moment where we're um, uh, procuring the um, expressions of interest from potential investors and developer, developers to enter into a joint venture partnership uh, with the council um, and I've explained the reasons why we're looking at we're using this model. I think it is a very exciting model that will enable us to um, uh, lever in uh, capital funding to take forward developments of around £1 billion pounds throughout the borough um, and that will bring new jobs and new investment into the world which will help us to achieve uh, certainly at least three of our, our business pledges in the 2020 plan. Um, the aim is to uh, come up with a preferred partner uh, by the end of this year, beginning of the new year. Of course I, I, I do agree and I accept that um, once the procurement process has been completed, um, that information um, in terms of the next stages needs to be shared with members. But there is a legal process which is uh, confidential at the moment, which I can't talk about, and um, that's quite right because that's, uh, uh, that, those are rules that we operate under. But absolutely, once the uh, procurement process has been completed and an identified uh, preferred partner has been uh, arrived at, then um, I'm, I'm happy to share that information with uh, uh, other party leaders and, and other members. And I think that's, that's it, Chair. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Davis. Thank you. Thank Councillor Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Councillor Whitney, in terms of the rest of the parking team, I'm sure it's not being pulled. It's just simply be deferred. Now we usually make the role just the semantics. With how much I said, they take the, the, the right decision, not the other arrangements. So it will be appearing on their transition or the fall on. So it's not important to be deferred. Um, street lighting, so if the council of the building, I'll, I'll say council of the building, just to consider bringing these together. Um, council of the building, just about how many street lights are coming to the house. Um, just it's not a We're not just responsible for 37,000. 470 slicing columns and 4,860 illuminated signs and bollards, which is a total, total of 42,313 illuminated assets, along with a few hundred thousand metres of private underground electricity cable, which is outside the means of Scottish power. The total number of known units at this time is 2,650, which equates to, say, 6.3% of our total asset base. The national average is 5%. 
know that consumers are not spoilers, unless due to supply faults, unless due to road traffic collisions, and unless due to vandalism or life expired equipment. The above is estimated at say 2150. This number will increase exponentially and quantities are known due to road traffic collisions, vandalism and the aging stock. Those street lights identified only all by the council's nighttime inspection regime and members of public reporting, which requires attendance. This figure is approximately 500 units. And just back to the question um, about the weekly we 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 day completion rate. Um, so, approximately 100 street lights are issued and attended to each week. This is managed through closely monitored maintenance budgets, which has seen significantly, which has seen a significant decrease over recent years. On average, 80 cents of street lights are repaired and 20 cents are condemned or require follow-up words, for example, requiring electricity supply repairs. This creates a challenge in managing demand pressures and expectations. However, the service has secured £500,000 of tax investment, which will address a significant number of condemned street lights. This street lighting program commences in November 2017. The service is in the final stage of contract award for the repair and placement of the long term fault on condemned street lights. This work will start in the coming weeks and is broken for completion by the end of March 2018. Huge advances will also, also be made in the last few years in regards to our phase one and the deep replacement program, which is probably the most important main road lighting, uh, 7,553 lighting units, and as such, dramatically reducing our overall energy consumption. Not only has our energy consumption reduced, but our carbon and our process have also reduced, so self towards meeting our environmental commitments. Following from this installation, also works have been carried out with the new secure funding for phase two of the installation project, which is successful, could incorporate the remaining license part. That's the uh, answer. Um, now, in, in regards to trees, um, 57 years of the new with respect to park trees, which is not in my remit. It's highway trees, is it? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you to 
to uh, Councillor Gilderbiss for giving me written notices uh, of his question. Uh, and of course, uh, Phil makes a reasonable point that these reports are designed to hold the uh, Council and, and the Cabinet particularly to account. Uh, I know we do agree with that, it's important that, that, that the Council does that. Um, but I believe that these reports do um, talk about the day-to-day -day, uh, issues that the Council is responsible for. So can I just remind Councillor Gilchrist and, and Council of some of the things in the portfolio holders' reports that are about the day-to-day -day activities that we're responsible for. So for example, Madam Mayor, uh, Cabinet Member for Housing um, and Community Safety in his report talked about the uh, World Safer Hub that uh, was opened um, last week, um, a fantastic facility combining the resources from a whole range of organisations, the police, uh, the council, the fire authority, third sector partners, um, and I believe that will be a major uh, move forward in terms of tackling um, anti-social behaviour and other, other forms of crime. Uh, in my own calls, I, I talked about the uh, continued increase in, in the employment rate, the great progress that we've made, I mentioned about the growth company and the exciting plans to um, open uh, the uh, Eureka, the second National Children's Museum uh, in Seacombe. Um, that's a very exciting development. Cabinet member for environment talked talk about in his report, world's first ever blue flag is flying over House and Drive Beach alongside another record number of green flags in our parks and once again rural residents have stepped up with some fantastic work in support of the Love Where You Live uh, initiative in the Rural and Bloom campaign. Cabinet Men for Children uh, has reported a 7% increase in young children uh, accessing support to ensure they're ready for school, uh, building on already excellent performance. And also she reports on improvement across all children's services it is rapidly picking up pace. And then finally, and these just two examples from the portfolio portfolio holders report, the cabinet member for finance and income regeneration uh, reports on the new policy on business rate support, uh, which was recently agreed at cabinet, helping us meet our pledge for thriving small businesses by ensuring more than 600 local companies will benefit from a discount and reduction in, in business rates. These are just a few examples, Madam Mayor, of the concrete achievements towards our 20 pledges. And I would just say to Councillor Gilchrist, if these kind of uh, initiatives aren't the bread and butter of what we should be doing as a council, helping our young people, protecting people from crime, improving our businesses, improving our, our young people, uh, protecting them, safeguarding them, I don't know what else is. What we, would we like to go into this report, that these reports that aren't covered by just some of those examples. So I would say to Councillor Gilchrist, I don't believe these are mockery, we use the words mockery. Um, and finally, uh, Madam Mayor, just last week, as we know, it, it was revealed that Wirral is amongst the happiest places to live in the country. And I can only assume that the research is did include Councillor Gilchrist in, in this survey. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. The question to uh, Councillor uh, Christian Spriggs, uh, Cabinet Member for uh, Delivering Differently. Uh, I was remiss, Madam um, Mayor, at the last Council meeting for not congratulating those new members uh, who've been appointed to the Cabinet. Certainly, the uh, Conservative Group now is looking for the final three appointees uh, with relish, namely the Cabinet Member for Value uh, for Money, the Cabinet Member for Public Accountability, and last but by no means least, the Cabinet Member for Common Sense. All three of which are in desperate need to go to supply. Madam Mayor, the question to Councillor Spriggs. A proposal for changing old age disability and mental health, item 39, from Cabinet on the 7th of October, was withdrawn as more work was required on it. Following concerns that we've all been made aware of by an email from uh, Sharon Miller within that department on the 21st of September. At a subsequent meeting for staff that was held on the 10th of October, it was agreed that this more work, as stated in Cabinet, included the issue of secondment of the Children with Disabilities Social Work Team. Does the Cabinet member believe that this issue can be fully investigated and resolved in time for Cabinet on the 6th of November as, as planned? Furthermore, can the Cabinet member please uh, outline the discussions and context that she has had with the staff in this service and confirm whether she, is, she has confidence 
in the proposal specifically to remove the safeguarding and other statutory duties which are included in the looked after team, uh, looked after children team from the specialist children with disabilities team, please. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking Councillor Lewis for his question and also for submitting it in advance at tonight's meeting. So I just want to start by being absolutely clear on what we're trying to achieve here. We want to create a better service, more joined up, more tailored to meet the needs of our most vulnerable children and adults with the most complex needs. People have told us time and again that they want services which are integrated, where they only have to tell their story once where the obstacles and the complicated systems and red tape is removed. They want easy access to the support they need, and that's what we're going to provide by going through this process. Our new integrated service will have social workers, support workers and nurses to work together to help the person in need and their family to achieve the best outcomes that they can in the quickest, easiest way possible. We want staff in children's, adults and health services to develop a shared culture and responsibility for the care of people with complex needs, focus, focusing only on what is important to people. To get there, we want to create multifunctional teams where services are merged to provide teams which can provide a true end, sorry, a true end-to-end -end service, providing all the support a disabled person and their family would need. Clearly, that's complicated and it involves redesigning traditional public sector structures and ways of working, which in some cases have remained unchanged for decades. Look, it's not surprising that this is unsettling for some of our staff, and I sympathise with that. I am committed to ensuring that in the coming weeks, every one of their concerns is listened to and considered. Just to also state, all posts will be protected within this piece of work, not one post is going as a result of the new services. One question raised by staff is the decision made by the directors of children's and adult health and care services to retain the function of child protection and some elements of looked after children work within children's services. This is a primary statutory duty of the council and it is vital that we get this right in the model, both now and into the future. We do not want workers to be conflicted in their role of supporting the family and protecting children. Senior officers feel very strongly that this approach is best for the service and the service users, but we do recognise that it's hard to ask staff to take on board change and to do something different. No one on this cabinet will accept any proposal which is not safe compliant with the law and able to provide the best possible service to our most vulnerable children and families. Safeguarding is everyone's business and all staff will have a major role to play in safeguarding children and adults. I fully support this proposal. I understand that staff have rightly raised their concerns and believe that the formal staff consultation process will be the appropriate way for their concerns to be taken into account. It's important, Councillor Lewis, is clear and does not misunderstand the situation. You need to be clear and not misunderstand the situation. The report to Cabinet in November in no way ends the debate or discussion on the issue. It simply provides Cabinet with an update on the progress so far and requests permission to begin consultation and continue working on the new service. I'm con confident to commit to the Chamber tonight that we will work continuously in the coming weeks and months to ensure the new integrated service provides a much improved service to every vulnerable resident who needs it. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, thank you. That's the end of the next questions. I'm now moving on to agenda item 8. Matters referred from the review scrutiny committee for the council of business. <coughs> Members will now turn to item 8 on page 67 to 74 of the council agenda. Which includes recommendations for environmental review and scrutiny committees on the 5th of July, over the environmental review and scrutiny on the 21st of September, and environmental review and scrutiny on the 21st of September. So, firstly, then, item A on page 67, 8K, environmental review and scrutiny committee, 5th of July, Green Belt. And I will invite Councillor Paul Stewart, the chair of the environmental review and scrutiny committee, to move the recommendation as set out on the agenda.
in the spectrum photograph of the face face, please clearly indicate. Now move to item 
3, on pages 87 to 160 of the agenda, 11 being carried on the 2nd of October, strategic regeneration framework. I now invite Council to the Council to move the recommendations as contained in the Cabinet Minutes, pages 88 to 89 of the Royal Agenda Papers. Thank you. Thank you. Second, thank you. Notice has been given of one amendment in respect of this item. It is set out on page one of the agenda supplement. I therefore call upon the mover and seconder of the amendment to please indicate. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Thank you, Councillor Mitchell. All right. Um, now, Councillor Davis, are you going to speak to, speak to this item? Yes. Thank you. We have up to five minutes. Thank you. Okay, I, I want to really focus my uh, comments on the, um, the amendments um, which is replying to that because uh, clearly this single uh, strategic regeneration framework is a, a key document which uh, maps out our kind of vision um, for regenerating the borough uh, over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, it's uh, it sets out high level aspirations rather than concrete plans, but I want to address the, uh, the amendment moved by uh, Stuart Kelly and, and David Mitchell, just um, give, give, a, give a view on that. And obviously, given the, uh, the importance of um, uh, these issues, I, I did seek the advice of officers, and uh, particularly the David Gawley, the head of planning on, um, on Stuart's amendment. Um, and I understand that um, Stuart may correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, uh, he's got a particular concern about references to the Hall of Eight Golf Resort. I'm sorry to I was concerned that no planning application had been submitted 
and that as it's done, the land use designation would require, at the very least, special circumstances to be demonstrated before it could be allowed. I received a reply on the 28th of September, like this. I agree there's been some potential for this document to be interpreted in conflicting with the Green Belt position. So on the one hand, you might be in favour of this as a general statement, but then be placed in the difficulty of balancing the application of this policy as against the actual Green Belt position, and be seen very specifically to be supported a development where, as you say, the planet has not been applied for. Two options are presented to me in that email, either to remove reference to Hoylake entirely from the framework, or not to proceed with the recommendation to make the framework a material consideration. 24 hours later, I received a further email, which, following discussions with report authors and planning officers, the recommendations were to stand and the advice changed. I naturally, Madam Mayor, asked on the Freedom of Information legislation to seek correspondence between officers that had led to this detail. Given that this is an open and transparent council, you will be surprised to learn that that request was refused. It isn't good enough, Madam Mayor, to pride ourselves that our planning committee and planning functions operate in an open and transparent and not open fashion. And I believe that to be the case of this. Even the fierce or lame whip can be brushed off the planning committee. The same standards must be seen to be true of the development of our planning policies. They're far too important in the long term to be said of that. The catalyst, acting as a developer, or as the sponsor of the developer, is entitled to make planning applications as it sees fit to pursue its policy. But these recommendations seek to instruct officers and members what should or shouldn't be considerations in the decision-making process. Ask yourself this. When was the last time we allowed the aspirations of a developer or the sponsor of a developer to dictate what should or shouldn't be a material planning consideration and what goes into the local plan? And where the cabinet is the main sponsor of this development. Since when has the policy of a single political party been considered a material planning consideration? And the mayor, I would ask the cabinet to take back its, its recommendations for the reason that I've lifted, listed. And if it will not, then I believe Council has to protect the integrity of our primary process by passing my amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Right, um, now I'm going to open this to any debate. Anybody want to contribute to the debate? Okay, so we'll open it up to Now, Councillor Davis, you've got a right of reply. Yeah. So I think we'll do that now.